Hello and welcome to the third episode of TLGT Talks. Today we are hosting Professor Dr. G S Bajpai. Professor Bajpai is the Vice Chancellor of Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law and an eminent lawyer. So if you are reading newspapers or watching televisions, you must be knowing him. Sir will be talking to us about cyber victimology and its daily application. So sir, the first question. First of all, thank you very much for joining us. So the first question is how is cyber victimology emerging as a new discipline and is there any substantial definition of it according to you? Yeah, so thank you for hosting me today. The cyber victimology has been emerging as a part of larger field of criminology as such. However, with the onslaught of a variety of cyber crime, initially there was an emergence of what we call cyber criminology. But looking at the plight of victim and the kind of uh, problems that they are facing, there is increasingly we find that there is interest on the part of researchers to look at the experiences of crime victims and the process of victimization and kind of uh, services they are provided with. So taken together, uh, this cyber victimology field is emerging. As far as definition is concerned, there is an agreement of uh, the contemporary scholars in the field that uh, cyber victimology involves the process of uh, victimization, uh, impact of victimization, and response to victimization. And uh, this also includes the different kind of uh, uh, characteristics and vulnerability of, that is associated with the victims of crime as a consequence of uh, different kind of exposures to cyber victimization risk. So, so um, as you've stated, um, the emerging discipline that cyber victimology is, how do you uh, believe that it's uh, linked to other disciplines and how do we differentiate a cyber victim as opposed to a real life victim? So it has two aspects. As far as uh, other disciplines are concerned, as I have just mentioned, Criminology and criminal laws are broader fields, which very well connect with uh, cyber victimology. So in cyber law field as such and cyber criminology as such, there are uh, different uh, areas which do have a kind of bordering with uh, uh, this field that is called now cyber victimology. So I would say criminology, criminal law, ICT, these are some important fields which have some interconnections as far as uh, cyber victimology is concerned. As far as uh, real life victims are concerned, I would say real life victimization, we very clearly identify, understand and feel because the victim is clearly identified, offenders are clearly identified and consequence of victimization are also very well known. However, uh, cyber victimization takes place in a virtual space. So the identity of the victim as well as the offender is hidden. Also the different issues connecting with cyber victimology and cyber victimizations are not very well visible. So in order to make them visible, there are a variety of ways and means. So in that sense, the real life victim uh, becomes quite different uh, from the cyber victims. So, so this question was scheduled for later, but since you are speaking about it, so we'd like to ask you about uh, it is easier to identify a real life criminal, but in cyber sphere, you know, it's tough to say who's a criminal and who's not. So how how does the legal legal recourse work for our cyber victim who has not even seen the criminal? And so even if the procedure is, is established, so how long should the aggravated wait? Isn't justice delayed, justice denied? So, uh, as I have mentioned that uh, cyber victimization takes place in a virtual world. The virtual spaces are not all the time amenable to be addressed by criminal laws or ICT laws. However, with the increase of uh, cyber victimization and cyber crime, we have now started recognizing the virtual space as a reality, which can be addressed with the help of legal provisions. So like, for instance, the IT Act in India becomes applicable to different virtual situations in which crime takes place, be it the fraud, be it the identity theft, data theft, or any kind of uh, this thing. So the good thing that happened in India in terms of uh, cyber jurisprudence is that we have given a legal recognition to virtual space. 
and therefore any victimization that is taking place in virtual spaces is also subject matter of law now. Because with the arrival of AI, metaverses, and other kinds of jurisdiction, the laws are increasingly trying to expand their reach to address the different kinds of issues which may have lots of legal implications to be handled and addressed by the laws. So in that sense, definitely, yes, that uh, the laws are going to be applicable in virtual space as well. So, so is it more like a Trishanko situation, like we don't know where we actually are, like you spoke about metaverse or dark web, for example. So a cryptocurrency, no one is knows, no one knows who runs it and things like those. So yeah, so these are the complex questions. And uh, to some extent, cyber uh, crime related issues, yes, we have been able to gain a lot of clarity. But as far as dark wave metaverses and other issues are concerned, uh, neither the laws are very clear at the moment, nor the jurisdiction issues have been, you know, received any, have received any clarity. So I would suggest that as the problem becomes serious, probably our understanding and recourse to legal application would also get mature. So I'm sure that, uh, uh, like for instance, in the European Union, uh, they could evolve the laws dealing with AI related uh, applications and all consequences, including the liability issues, contractual issues. So law, the issue remains that law travels at a pace which is quite slower than the pace with which the crimes are committed. And as long as that gaps remain there, uh, some issues would also be there. So probably the laws have to become a lot more proactive in terms of making all necessary preparations to deal with these challenges. Right, sir. And execute, executive body exactly. should also. Exactly. We need to have a backup institutional support because law will alone not function. You need institution, institutional preparedness to handle all these things. So, sir, there is there is a difference in space transition, like how people behave online and how they behave online. So, is this difference the the reason behind cyber victimization? Yeah. So, this transition is really very crucial, as well as interesting for criminologists and cyber victimologists, and they are looking at uh, the characteristics of criminal behavior in real world. Real world criminal behavior as I'm saying, <clears throat> is a lot more uh, predictable. Predictability of criminal behavior in real world is far visible because of our understanding of criminological uh, factors which define this behavior is quite uh, convincing. However, a lot of uh, people and researchers have yet to answer what happens with this transition from real world to virtual world takes place, whether there is a significant change, the way criminals do commit their crime, or what happened. I would say that answer lies in this fact itself, because this transition is crucial, because in the virtual world, the offenders, the perpetrators find it quite easier to get away with crime, with the fact that the, the identity is hidden and they know that their the chances of the identity disclosures are far lesser. One. Second, they easily find the victims who are vulnerable. So the potential targets are always available in virtual world more than the real world. So we become very susceptible if we are transacting online anything because you don't know the risk, risk exposure involved. So this transition involves a variety of factors which not only tempt an offender to commit crime, but also make a victim vulnerable for uh, different kinds of victimization. So in, uh, within the context of space transition, if we look at the context of India, uh, especially rural and urban society, um, how how does victim precipitation or victim facilitation for that matter uh, comes into picture in according to you? See, victim precipitation and victim facilitation 
in victimology has uh, largely been uh, you know studied and associated with uh, immediate provocation which is triggered by the victim on account of his or her behavior so suppose certain degree of provocation is factored by the victim because of which offender gets into action and commits a crime that was that is the ordinary situation where victim triggered behavior happens sometimes victim triggered behavior result into a commission of crime uh, as far as cyber victimization is concerned uh, there is no direct precipitation however certain personality traits certain behavioral disposition certain factors do place a victim in a situation of risk so unknowingly victim make himself vulnerable so like for instance the longing for earning a quick money and getting into the trap of a potential fraudster is something which is a factor uh, falling in the category of victim facilitation because victim is disclosing a crucial information in the anticipation of some gain or some undue gain or illegal gain so this is how the entire psychology works so offenders play with the psychology of the victim in a manner whereby the victim is placed in a situation where they are more likely to make themselves vulnerable for a variety of losses so sometimes you are sharing your crucial information in anticipation of getting some huge money or something and in the process you lose lot of money so that's why the victim behavior is generally uh, not disclosed to the agencies because agencies want what exactly have you done they would like to censor their role as to why i have involved them what i have done so those things are very very crucial therefore uh, victim behavior in cyber space making him vulnerable is something to be looked at more closely it's a binary psychology exactly. like binary crime so um like you've talked about impressionable victims and age gap um do you think uh, because we uh, especially impressionable victims are exposed to a pool of resources the internet like the trishanku situation has left no room for wonderment um is this uh, sort of uh, exposure uh, the reason why we are being targeted especially in terms of people who want to get easy success yeah so actually i i remember uh, uh, there was a book published a couple of years ago titled uh, risk society we are living in a risk society where factors making us vulnerable are far too many and we are unable or unaware of the such exposures because target selection on the part of an offender is a conscious process who is to be targeted is not a random thing so what is to be seen or what is studied by an offender as for the for, for a potential target is something very important and crucial so i always say and maintain that in such cases the victims uh, behavioral factors personal factors his personal profile all these things become very crucial all are not easy target some are invincible and some are vulnerable so who are invincible <clears throat> those who are in a position to guard themselves from so there is a term which is called uh, <clears throat> target hardening target hardening target hardening target target hardening is a process whereby victim is strengthened in terms of behavior in terms of safeguard in terms of his or her awareness against all such exposures so if you make target hardening through education through awareness you can avoid lot of victimization and th therefore th it is said that crimes are committed when they are easy to commit so easy to commit means easy prey is something which becomes a very crucial thing in the entire cyber victimization process in fact in cyber victimology there is a whole lot of debate and research on victimization risk what are the sources of victimization risk 
and risk of victimization is not uniformly distributed in the society. I'm trying to answer your question. It is concentrated with certain group of people, certain sections of the people, certain personality traits. So that's why you'll find there is a heterogeneous distribution of risk exposure and victimization rate. Some places are more vulnerable. Some situations are more vulnerable. So we need to do a lot of vulnerability mapping and risk mapping in order to carry out what is called de-victimization. So this victimization prevention can be effectively carried out in cyber victimization cases especially by way of understanding why, because some people are repeatedly victimized. So once you are victimized, then you should be knowledgeable enough as to what happened. But as I'm saying, it is a part of their personality trait. They are more often likely to get into the trap again and again. So why some people become uh, repeated victims? Multiple victimization, repeated victimization, perpetual victimization. So these traits do indicate a uh, certain degree of vulnerability with certain people and certain factors associated with these people, which make them vulnerable more than others. So what are those factors exactly? I said, so like for instance, my behavioral pattern. So if I am at public place, how I'm behaving, I'm, I'm, I'm showing casual attitude, I am appearing to be casual. I am doing lot many other things which are decoded to be, oh. you know, facilitating by the others. So whole lot of discussion, personality profile, young people are more likely. Sometimes the people from countryside who come in big urban city, they behave very awkwardly. They are unable to manage their things. These small things are decoded uh, by the potential uh, offender to commit different kinds of crime. Sir, in, in a lecture on uh, on cyber law, uh, so our teacher mm -hmm. <clears throat> told us about this case of Locanto app, mm -hmm. in which there is a person, there's a person who made an account on the app and he used to chat with men by pretending to be a girl. And he chatted with over 500, 500, 512 men and made some 22 lakh rupees. Mm -hmm. So at that time he was, he was able to target the exact psyche of those those victims actually but are those the people who who have been victims here are they of pure mind because you know they they have fallen into trap like this so 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 again if you are falling into such kind of trap means your some weaknesses are being exploited so because in all those conversations you are likely to disclose certain things which may later become uh, a matter of exploitation for you, like honey trap. Honey trap is precisely a situation where the human weaknesses and other kinds of uh, uh, hidden facts are exploited by these potential offenders to extort money. And the cases are many in India. Revenge porn. You know, all these things are very common. So initially, the people who are into this, they do something which become a sort of uh, occasion or a material to be resorted for this kind of crime. So sir, is, is public awareness the only way out or the best way out? I would not say that public awareness alone can stop because there is a lot more professional approach is needed. So like, for instance, I can provide you an example of uh, the UK where I did my postdoctorate and I did work on this subject, uh, which is called situational crime prevention. So in the UK, there is a program called crime reduction. Crime reduction is a conscious arrangement where some dedicated measures are undertaken by the local police and agency to target certain forms of victimization precisely and they are able to cut down the victimization rate significantly. So I think a lot more proactive approach has to be taken. Like for instance, in India, cyber victimization cases are too many, where the people are. So agencies are creating certain things, like for instance, we have created a PIN, we have created CCTV, we have created a lot more safety guards in our bank account. 
all these things need to be strengthened more and more. So technology is an answer to stop this crime and this victimization, as far as cyber victimization is concerned. So technology is the answer because technology is being exploited. So technology is the only answer. So um, there was a term that you mentioned, de-victimization. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in lines with de-victimization, in your article, recognition of victimhood vital for justice, uh, we read it and we also, uh, in lines with CRPC, uh, it's written that, that no one is recognized a victim until an accused is charged. So if we are moving towards de-victimization or even if we are categorizing this heterogeneous set of people as victims, isn't it necessary that we move towards decriminalization um, instead of de-victimization in cyber crimes? Yeah, so uh, criminology is the reversal of victimology. The language that we use in criminology is offender-centric, and in victimology, we are victim-centric. So to that extent, de-victimization and uh, uh, decriminalization are different. However, as far as recognition of uh, victimhood is concerned, uh, actually, our criminal justice system has long been ignoring the status of victim as such, because our laws were primarily created to deal with offenders and not to deal with the victims of crime. Therefore, there were not many arrangements and recourses available for the victims of crime to be dealt with. Lately, with the uh, induction of uh, some new legislative developments and some new case laws, uh, cases decided by the Supreme Court, uh, the victim has not only been recognized in the law, but also provided with uh, certain rights and status, whereby victim can assert certain uh, level of participation in criminal justice process. So when we were talking about crime prevention and decriminalization, de de so we were essentially talking prevention of crime from the viewpoint of offender. So, yeah, so like, for instance, offenders need to be given good education, good family conditions so that they don't get into crime. In de-victimization, we are talking about those measures, like in the UK, I have given an example of a situational crime prevention. There, we are talking about the education and the awareness which should be provided to the victim and target hardening kind of solutions, which are very crucial. And also uh, other forms of, uh, uh, you know, arrangements like in the U.S., they have launched a program called uh, uh, Project Broken Window. Project Broken Window, you must have heard, which means the localities which are in a state of neglect are more likely to target for burglary and other forms of crime. So Broken Window is a indicator of a community in a state of neglect, and that has to be fixed immediately. Broken window has become a symbol. So we have a lot, lot many you know, examples of broken window in our cases. Now, those areas need to be given attention to, and there are lots of people who are in need of attention in terms of protection, in terms of uh, rehabilitation, because they are exploited sometimes. But, but so in that sense, I am just uh, saying that uh, these approaches could be very, very vital for, uh, from the viewpoint of uh, what we call now victim justice. That's why we have reversed the idea of criminal justice to become the idea of victim justice. So from a jurisprudential point of view, um, what came first? Is it a victim uh, criminology or cyber criminology or cyber victimology? You know, I would say uh, uh, very in a larger context that uh, victimology is as old as human suffering itself. Because suffering has to be addressed. So victimology deals with the aspect of human suffering. So victimology is an answer and a response to human suffering, largely speaking. However, in our laws, in our institutional creations, we, we were more concerned about lawbreaking. And we wanted to deal with lawbreakers. 
because however we ignore the fact that law breaking results into the commission of victimization and in different forms of uh, suffering now for long long time we didn't have any arrangement or mechanism to address human suffering therefore the emergence of victimology came as a collateral consequence to address the human suffering as a consequence of crime or, or secondary victimization secondary victimization uh, is a processual consequence when a person gets into the criminal justice system and a victim has to struggle sometime harassed sometime exploited sometime rejected sometime put to a shaming sometime dealt with a very stern hand secondary victimization somebody has to address this secondary victimization so victimological researches and actions are now geared to mitigate these pains which are crucial for the victim because victim is integral to criminal justice system and victim has to give in almost similar footing and spaces as it's given to the offender so for all fairness both the parties have to give an equal attention so so since you said that victimology is as old, as old as human kind so uh, so what what makes people do cyber crimes for example in real life if if i want to commit a crime on someone so there will be some reason behind it like that person has done something to me or i, I have a grudge against a certain person but here you have not seen the victim we are just randomly mailing them or just talking them on social media or doing things like that so what is the main reason behind the offender's conduct so if you go to the criminal psychology you will get a lot of answer so sometime <clears throat> the offen offenses are committed in different settings sometimes offense is committed against a known person because you have some past history with him now of sometimes the offenses are committed uh, against the stranger but you you have certain illegal gains to be extracted depending on the nature of crime if you are committing an offense which involves money it is it hardly matters whether offender is known to you or uh, victim is known to you or not known to you because your target is money so therefore a money related cyber victimization doesn't have any victim offender relationship history otherwise if you see like in violent crime more than 60% 70% victim offenders are known to each other there is a victim offender relationship in cyber in all cyber crime you will not find that there is a victim offender relationship in other forms of which are love related uh, relationship related there you will find association and relationship working so depending on the nature of crime you will find victim of, of victim offender relationship figuring right but sir in suppose you have you have the cell phone and i have to send virus in this phone and i don't know you but still i am mailing you some files that contain that virus and it opens in your phone and your phone gets corrupted so what what will be my psyche behind it so so again see when this virus is you know spread it you will find that uh, there are some benefits so there are companies who are going to be benefited some people are hired to spread virus so they are getting money for that job they are not concerned who you are you who are you they are it is their job they have been assigned this task by certain companies to spread this virus and they are doing that so you please remember there is always illegal gain in the commission of crime sometimes crimes are committed for sadistic pleasure i'm not saying but it it is also definable if you go to the freudian psychology even when you commit anything irrational it is a rational visibly but you derive certain psychological pleasures out of it so to that extent it is you are connect with that crime criminal psychology has answer freud said nothing is uncaused it is a different matter that sometime your conscious mind works then the relationship is very clear sometime your subconscious mind works then the association between crime and victim is not clear sometime your unconscious mind serial killer sometimes you don't know only pleasure right so 
So what is your view on profiling of cyber victims? Yeah, so profiling actually came into being on account of uh, several cases of victimization when we were happening. So it was a policy requirement. We wanted to know the different categories of victims. So like, for instance, if I map, suppose there are, there are 500 crime or 5,000 crime in a state. If I put them in the bracket of certain characteristics, I can get certain concentration like age wise, like occupation wise. This is called profiling. So if I class whether they come from educated class or a literate class, rich class, poor class, urban class, rural class. So there are different dimensions of profiling. Now this profiling can answer you too many questions when it comes to uh, prepare your strategy to prevent it. So I want to focus on urban area because most of the crimes are concentrated in the urban area. It is the students who are getting more and more victimized. So I can focus on this. So profiling actually started with criminal criminals profiling in general. But then it came to cyber profiling and cyber victim profiling also because we, we want to provide them rehabilitation and other kinds of services to mitigate the impact of victimization. So in that sense, profiling is very important. So profiling is now done by uh, experts and they assist essentially to different agencies who are involved in the job of service providing and rehabilitation to the victims of uh, cyber offenses. So isn't everyone a cyber victim? For example, you, you have gone to a place and used your card to pay something. So your card is visible in the CCTV cameras and the CVV is also visible. So the, the offenders, they can you know, use that information and you're not you're not knowing that such thing is happening happening with you. So is it so you are right. Everybody is a potential victim in victimology. The saying goes like that. Everybody is a potential. So when you walk out from the safeguards of your home, you are under certain exposure. It is a different matter. You are spared. But chances of your victimization are equally distributed. So when you use certain e-transactions in virtual spaces, depending on various factors, you do carry a risk. That is a that is a truth. However, this is the price we pay for technology use or e-transaction thing. And time and again, we get to know that these things are, you know, risk prone. So like the roads which are very you know venturesome they are too enjoyable to drive but, you know but so this is the life everybody is a potential victim in an era in which we are living where technology is buzzing mm -hmm. e-transactions are happening and we are into it we are getting a lot of advantage and this is the price that we are paying how does um so we talked about a victim re rehabilitation. So rehabilitation in life happens with victims and also with offenders, which is a different phenomenon. But how do we bring legal closure or rehabilitation for a cyber victim? Wherein so, so, so the consequence of cyber victimizations are different from the consequence of crime in other cases. So like, for instance, a victim of violent offense would require a different type of service like medical, psychological. Cyber victim counseling is basically, uh, so depending on crimes, we cannot put simply cyber crime to understand all victims. Mostly I have seen there is a lot of problem in online sexual abuse, like for instance, online sexual offenses, child against the children, against the teenagers, so they get into depression, they get into a lot of anxiety. So uh, primarily they won't come forward to disclose the commission of crime. Even if they do come by, due to some reason, then they will be suddenly blank. So you need a trained counselor. So that's why psychology, uh, the cyber uh, victimization counseling and services are now at place, which are not only giving you education, against all these things, but are also providing post-victimization services. So there are pre-victimization services, there are post-victimization services. 
post victimization services in case of uh, sexual offenses they are very grave because depression anxiety insecurities uh, psychological trauma conflict all kinds of issues happen so there is a need for uh, serious uh, counseling services in this sphere so um in regards to uh, what goes on online especially social media validation is a big concern rather a concept around which everything is surrounded so uh, validation varies by age as well so in case of impressionable victims that experience cyberbullying particularly is that a particular like a tunnel vision cause of cyber victimization you know in social media and related uh, issues like hate crime like cyberbullying uh, if you see the uh, entire spectrum of uh, cyber uh, crime that cyber victimization you will find a sizable percentage concentrating with respect to uh, these offenses especially cyberbullying so there are certain factors number one uh, many victims will not understand the fact that they don't know the whether it is a crime or not as such because you are simply bullying now bullying doesn't mean always doesn't look like a full fledged offense as such so sometimes victim is confused whether it is a crime or it is just a behavior casual behavior on the part of some person whom they are known to but the degree of cyber bullying sometime go to an extent you you are fully aware that people commit suicide yes there are cases in cyber bullying where people have committed suicide because they were unable to cope up as an and the the worst part is the entire terrain of cyber crime is hidden from the real world so what is happening that people are suffering and they continue to suffer the most difficult part in such offenses that it is not easy to get out of it it is not easy to because the connect is already established the offender is in possession of lot of information about you and you he has a record of your conversation now that record makes you more vulnerable that is the whole issue and uh, validation as far as concern you will find that social media has given almost validation to everything we have uh, we have shown lot more social tolerance to these kinds of things there is a growing social tolerance people do not find uh trolling trolling anything you know very serious trolling is now accepted you can be trolled you can be grilled you can be roasted yes. so now roasting is happening publicly and if you go to the police they will they will try to give you a reason that uh, non non cognizable offense is made out and now you have to go to a very difficult uh, defamation suit you know defamation suits are very difficult to be maintained of law even criminal defamation so you see in the lately lot of defamation suit especially in case of high profile people have gone to the courts and you will find so i always believe that uh, for those kinds of uh, you know behavior this law is not suited because this law was never created to deal with these crimes so therefore i still feel there is a need to have uh, different types of provisions to deal with the people's behavior on social media that regulatory framework is still missing and because of which lot of people are put to all kinds of inconveniences and they go get free and they exploit the lack of uh, provisions in the law exactly so earlier people used to get a lot affected with some when something about them has been posted on social yeah. media but now these beam page are there there is a validation they think it goes like that but say is it a genuine validation? validation i think it's not a genuine validation see if i am inconvenienced by your behavior and genuinely i am disturbed then there sh i should have a clear cut recourse to a process which should provide me relief that relief and that process is not at the place at the moment that's why probably uh, 
there is a suggestion which is going in the in the media that uh, the government has to come out with some regulatory framework to deal with different kinds of as i said the, our laws were never created to deal with these things so sir you spoke about this data that, that has been stored in clouds and these things like so the internet along with being a source it is a it is an archive as well like whatever goes online it never goes offline so uh, even if the the criminal you know the cyber criminal he has been traced or punished how does the victim believe that their information is safe or it will not come back to haunt them in future will will it be so that is another gray area as far as uh, the laws are concerned right to be forgotten has not been fully granted in our country though there are many petitions which are lying before the court especially high courts but uh, uh, in many cases the court has refused to interfere with because there is a freedom of expression is also there so court is saying that uh, we cannot uh, uh, do a particular order to erase all the information with respect to any such happening which was true which was found to be true if it is found to be false probably yes but if it is found to be true and somebody was convicted they, so i feel that uh, right to be forgotten has to be debated more seriously and there is a need to find out the areas where this can become applicable i have written a couple of articles on this and i find that uh, there is a growing awareness now because in many jurisdiction they have provided right to be forgotten in many countries so to a limited extent this right can be provided this is my understanding and there are multiple situation where this right can work and can save people from undue you know representation or undue uh, data record which can become difficult later for them so since this podcast goes to the common people also are not linked to law so could you please define uh, this cyber victimology not cyber victimology sir this term that you just used uh, right to try to be forgotten the right to be forgotten means uh, as you have rightly just mentioned that uh, suppose uh, uh, a news uh, defamatory uh, news containing some obnoxious material is published against me i go to the court and my contention was found to be true and i i get a favorable order from the court and person is punished to that extent the matter ends here but the material which is already in public domain suppose there were 20 newspaper which have carried that that will continue to be there and people would not know whether that was right or not that would continue to cast certain uh, aspersion and certain belief in my case and similarly there are various situations suppose a petition against you goes to the court that you have done something wrong because it is easy to file a petition in the court now the copy of that petition is published everywhere later on that petition is dismissed but the traces of that petition will be on the internet and they will continue to somehow put you in a bad light so in that sense probably right to be forgotten so i want to erase my undue information which has no legal relevance or which which pertain to a issue which has already been decided in my favor that part has to be erased that is the content of right to be forgotten so if that is done so lot of people will feel relieved because otherwise suppose i go to the interview there is a false complaint against me sexual harassment my employer will see simply new oh he will not try to find out what happened to that case later on this news is enough against me which will devour me and they will not officially say i am dismissing you i am rejecting you on the, but they will make up their mind so people do lot of stereotyping about you right so we have seen a lot of these lot of these examples so so since you spoke about right to be forgotten so what else changes do you think are required in law in substantive and procedural law so 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 i think uh, uh, in both the cases uh, right to be forgotten has to somewhere because because especially i think this right can be well located in uh, data protection bill which is again going to be with us bill is coming up 
Now in that part, they can define the right to be forgotten along with the areas and its applicability and exception. So I think that is the best place and it would involve wherever data is involved. Suppose a crime is committed and I have to give some restraining order or some uh, news have to be raised from the social media. Those orders can be done. At the moment, these uh, platforms, they do not uh, comply the court order. They said, this is our uh, right to publish. And we have published, we will not erase. Okay. So, sir, the last question is, uh, can there be a total redemption in case of cyber victim? Uh, uh, total, see, once a person becomes victim, uh, victim uh, certain scars continue to be there. So total redemption is a very utopian thing. I would say uh, attempts should be made to mitigate the suffering to the extent they are possible. So like, for instance, if you must be seeing the train, suppose my uh, money is illegally transferred from my account and the process takes place and the offender is punished. But at times the offender said, the money I have spent, you can give me punishment. But the complainant in such cases at least, because there is no revenge feeling, in such cases they are not much concerned with the punishment part. Their interest is to get that money back. Then the redemption is possible. Their re redemption in this case is linked with the possibility of the entire money being returned back to the public. However, in violent offenses which involves social media, there I would say, in, see, people are very revengeful. They want immediately the person to be hanged. So only then I will be satisfied. So I won't say that complete redemption is possible, but yes, mitigation is an answer. Right. Because you and my, say, so this, this one instance happened with us during this COVID two years break. So when we used to have these online classes, we started with Google Meet and there people used to log in with, you know, XYZ IDs and like play music or present on a screen and do things. So they were not known, the people of our class only. They intrude into our meetings. Right. Yeah. While in real class, these kind of things could not happen. Like. Yeah, so, so I always said technology is exploited many times for certain misuse and those vulnerabilities are actually if you see the cyber infrastructure in your countries is still very vulnerable critical info information infrastructures are still very very vulnerable sometimes the strongest data network are invaded china new york all have experienced you know the intrusion and invasion so that possibility is there because technology is changing very fast. New tools are always there. You never know. So to that extent, this technology is definitely vulnerable and will, will come with a price tag. Exactly. So are these things committed? The people, they just feel cool to commit these kind of things? Yeah, so there, are, there is a, a term, you know, joy riding delinquency. Joyriding delinquency is state for the sex sake of pleasure seeking. Thrill seeking and pleasure seeking in youth is sometimes so they, they are so like hacking. Hacking is a sort of thrill. So many people try to do illegal th hacking. So certainly it happens in uh, cyber world also. Also, sir, this this last question: uh, Why is it getting more and more professionalized? Like you also said that this they sit in offices and you know the, this is the task that they are given, they are being given. So, why are people getting becoming more and more sadist these days? No, actually, this is a very uh, fundamental question. So, I think we need to go to the fundamentals of uh, human behavior, and in criminal psychology. Uh, the psyche of criminal has been decoded. If you study, you know, Isaac, Isaac has been a very notable criminal psychologist. So he has come out with findings that different motivations work in case of people. For some, it is 
uh, a thrill. For some, it is a revenge against the system. For some, it is a score setting. For some, it is just uh, they want to break a boredom. So there are different kinds of motivations. So criminal behavior is very, very mysterious in that sense. And you will always find that there are motivated offenders, despite all education, despite all progress, and they are so motivated. After all, you have seen the people, uh, the, the motivation to the extent that uh, they blew away the tower. Right, tower. right. You are. You, to do that crime, you need to be in a state of highest motivation. There are people, terrorist crime, human bombing, it is committed with uh, a sense of highest degree of motivation. So, so it is, it is different. So, it, it is, there is a personality type. There are personality type who are more susceptible to do crime. That is what uh, Isaac uh, said, psychotism, neuroticism. These are the people who have uh, different uh, tendencies. So sometimes people commit crime to resolve their inner conflict. I have a conscious conflict where I find all parents are bad. So killing parents will be my pleasure. So you, and in doing so, you are able to reconcile with the conflict which is operating at your subconscious mind. So these are the very you know mysterious interpretation for criminality. So do you have some piece of advice for youngsters like us or those who are listening us to be safe against these cyber crimes or not be cyber victim? Yeah, I definitely I would say you need to be very careful and do not do anything casually because your casual behavior is not only put you in danger, but sometimes exploited for certain illegal gains. Uh, and you should be, you know, Internet and cyber literate. These days, a lot of literature is coming up. Responsible internet, responsible cyber behavior. So there are positive learning which are coming out. I think you can look at some of these things, and they, especially for uh, young youngsters who are in schools, are coming just out of school and joining colleges. They need to understand the the, the cyber world. So internet with responsibility is the message probably which can make you safe and uh, you know secure but this has been a very interesting podcast and we wanted to go in endlessly but we are short of time and you are short of time also so we'll, we'll thank you and also i'd like to take a note of our teachers dr imit walia and mr ankit kaushik who are, who helped us in framing this questionnaire and you know successful conduct of this podcast thank you so much my sir. pleasure thank you so much